Review from Class Lecture on HIV Infection, Chapter 15 of the Lewis Textbook. HIV can be transmitted under specific conditions that allow contact with infected body fluids, including blood, semen, vaginal secretions, rectal fluid, and breast milk. The most common mode of HIV transmission is unprotected sexual contact with an HIV-infected partner. During any form of sexual intercourse, anal, vaginal, or oral, the risk of infection is greater for the partner who receives the semen, although infection can also be transmitted to the inserting partner. This occurs because the receiver has prolonged contact with the infected fluids and helps explain why it is easier to infect women than men during heterosexual intercourse. Transmission of HIV, contact with blood and blood products. Infection through transfusion of blood or clotting factors is now highly unlikely with implementation of screening measures. Puncture wounds are the most common means of work-related HIV transmission. Routine screening of blood donors to identify at-risk individuals and testing donated blood for the presence of HIV have improved the safety of the blood supply. The risk is higher if exposure involves blood from a patient with a high level of circulating HIV a deep puncture wound, a needle with a hollow bore, and visible blood, and a device used for venous or arterial access or a patient who dies within 60 days. Splash exposures of blood on skin with an open lesion present has some risk, but it is much lower than from a puncture wound. Healthcare workers have a low risk of acquiring HIV at work even after a needle stick injury. HIV-infected individuals can transmit HIV to others within a few days after becoming infected. Transmission of HIV is subject to the same requirements as other microorganisms. A large enough amount of the virus must enter the body of a susceptible host. The infection is influenced by frequency of contact with the organism, volume, virulence, and concentration of the organism, and the host's immune status. HIV is not spread through casual contact. Even without symptoms, HIV replication occurs at a rapid and constant rate in the blood and lymph tissues. However, if the patient experiences rapid replication, then errors can occur in the copying process causing mutations. The mutations are what contribute to resistance to the antiretroviral therapy and then limit treatment options. HIV is an RNA virus which replicates by using its template to produce DNA, which is then integrated into the human genome. HIV destroys about 1 billion CD4 T cells every day. The body is able to produce new CD4 T cells to replace the destroyed cells for many years, but eventually the ability of HIV to destroy the T cells exceeds the body's ability to replace the cells. The immune problems start when the CD4 T cells drop to less than 500. Severe problems develop when it's less than 200. Now keep in mind the normal range is 800 to 1200. With HIV, a point is eventually reached where so many T cells have been destroyed that there is not enough left to regulate the immune responses. HIV infections are divided into different stages, including acute, asymptomatic, symptomatic, and AIDS. In acute HIV, seroconversion is often accompanied by a mononucleosis-like syndrome that may be mistaken for the flu. These symptoms generally occur two to four weeks after the initial infection and last for one to two weeks, although some symptoms may persist for several months. Some people also develop neurological complications such as aseptic meningitis, peripheral neuropathy, facial palsies, or Guillain-Barre syndrome. During this time, a high viral load is noted and the CD4 T cell counts fall temporarily but quickly return to baseline or near baseline. Many people, including healthcare providers, mistake acute HIV symptoms for a bad case of the flu. Asymptomatic infection, the patient could have fatigue, headache, low-grade fever, and night sweats. Most are not aware of the infected status and so continue their usual activities, which may include high-risk sexual or drug use behaviors, causing a serious public health problem. Asymptomatic infection is the interval between untreated HIV infection and a diagnosis of AIDS. And during this time, the CD4 T cell counts can remain above 500 and the viral load in the blood will be low. Because people are often unaware of this disease status, they have little reason to seek treatment or make behavior changes that could improve the quality and length of their lives and unknowingly 
Transmit HIV to others. HIV wasting syndrome is a progressive and unintended loss of more than 10% of the body weight. The symptoms of wasting, which include diarrhea, fever, poor appetite, and weakness, contribute to loss of both body fat and lean body mass, leaving the patient susceptible to further illness. Medications the patient may take to help improve their appetite would be Megase, Marinol, Decadron, and Prednisone. The metabolic expenditure of fever also promotes fatigue, muscle wasting, and malnourishment. For fever and sweats, the patient can be given nonsteroidals and acetaminophen, also propanolol, anoxalytics, anticholinergics, scopolamine, hyoscyamine, and glycopyrrolate can be given. Fatigue not relieved by rest can be incapacitating, which could be from decreased oxygen, anemia, anxiety, or depression. Erythropoietin is expensive and benefits can show good results in four to six weeks. Fever, also consider Decadron to decrease swelling. About 5% of cancer patients have tumor-induced fever and sweating, and a tumor protein may act as an endogenous pyrogen on the hypothalamic temperature regulators, and a patient can lose up to a half a liter of fluid a day. Anxiety can cause sweating, so propanolol 20 mg to 40 mg four times a day reduces the somatic effects of anxiety like sweating, tremor, and palpitations. Many have dry mouth and increased heart rate from the anticholinergic, so frequent mouth care would be important. Night sweats differ from other sweating in that they occur without exercise, and it happens while they're sleeping and can be very profuse, soaking their bedclothes, sheets, and blanket. The worst thing about night sweats, though, is that it's very uncomfortable and sleep becomes difficult whenever their pajamas are soaked with sweat. Part of patient teaching is to let them know that if they wake up in the middle of the night, tell them to take a cool bath or shower and change into dry clothes. Change the bedding and make sure that they use a waterproof pad under the dry bedding to protect the mattress from being saturated from the sweat. If weather permits, open a bedroom window or use a fan to circulate air, but to be careful to avoid a chill. Symptomatic infection occurs as the CD4 T cell count drops to 200 to 500 and the viral load increases. Symptoms seen in earlier phases become worse, leading to persistent fever, frequent drenching of the night sweats, chronic diarrhea, recurrent headaches, and fatigue severe enough to interrupt normal routines. Other infections that can occur at this time include shingles, persistent vaginal canada infections, outbreaks of oral and genital herpes, and bacterial infections. The progression of HIV is monitored by two important lab assessments, the CD4 T cell counts and HIV viral load. Now remember, we said the CD4 T cell range was 800 to 1200. In HIV, the viral loads are reported as real numbers or as undetectable. Undetectable indicates the viral load is lower than the test is able to report, but it does not mean that the virus has been eliminated from the body or that the individual can no longer transmit HIV to others. Abnormal blood test results are common to HIV infection and may be caused by the HIV, opportunistic diseases, or complications of therapy. Decreased white blood cell counts, especially below normal numbers of lymphocytes, neutrophils, low platelet counts, and anemia are often seen. Altered liver function caused by the HIV infection, drug therapy, or co-infection with the hepatitis virus is common. Early detection of co-infection with hepatitis B or hepatitis C is extremely important because these infections have a more serious course in patients with HIV. AIDS then becomes when the immune system is severely compromised and they are at a greater risk for an opportunistic disease, possible malignancies, wasting, and dementia. An opportunistic infection is an organism that does not cause severe disease in people with functioning immune system can now cause debilitating, disseminated, and life-threatening infections during this stage. Several opportunistic diseases may occur at the same time, further compounding the difficulties of diagnosis and treatment. Prevention is the preferred approach to opportunistic diseases and adequate antiretroviral therapy, vaccines for hepatitis B, influenza, pneumococcal, and disease-specific prevention measures can be effective in delaying or preventing many of the opportunistic diseases associated with HIV. Examples of opportunistic diseases include pneumocystis pneumonia, mycobacterium avium complex, and Kaposi sarcoma. Cytomegalovirus retinitis. 
You can see here patches of the retinal whitening. This is associated with retinal vasculitis, hemorrhage, and necrosis. The virus gets into the vascular endothelium, closes off blood vessels, and spreads through the tissue like wildfire. The entire retina can be destroyed within weeks. Lymphadenopathy. This is expected in HIV, and it's important to let a patient know that this may happen. The most common infection associated with symptomatic infection phase of HIV is oropharyngeal candidiasis or thrush. Canada rarely causes problem in healthy adults, but is more common in HIV infected people. Carposi sarcoma is a malignant vascular lesion that can appear anywhere on the skin surface or on an internal organ. Lesions can vary in size from pinpoint to very large and may appear in a variety of shades. Oral hairy leukoplakia, an Epstein-Barr virus infection that causes a painless white raised lesions on the lateral aspect of the tongue, can occur at this phase if the infection and is also an indicator of disease progression. Pneumocystis pneumonia, this is an opportunistic disease that generally does not occur in the presence of a functioning immune system. Pneumocystis is a type of pneumonia that does appear as an opportunistic disease associated with HIV infection. The diagnosis of HIV infection is made by testing for HIV antibodies and antigens in the blood. The most useful screening tests for HIV are those that detect HIV-specific antibodies. The major problem with these tests is that there is a delay of like four weeks after the infection before antibodies can be detected. This creates a window period during which an infected individual may not test positive for HIV antibodies. The genotype assay detects the drug resistance viral mutations that are present in reverse transcriptase and protein genes. The phenotype assay measures the growth of HIV in various concentrations of the antiretroviral drugs, much like bacteria antibiotic sensitivity tests. These are two types of resistance tests that can determine if a patient's HIV is resistant to drugs used in the antiretroviral therapy. These assays help to determine new drug combinations for patients who are not responding to therapy. Rapid HIV antibody tests provide results in 20 minutes and are recommended by the CDC. A standard antibody test done on blood or oral fluid specimens are tested by a lab and provide results from a day to a week later. Rapid testing is highly reliable and provides immediate feedback to patients who then can be counseled about treatment and prevention. The ELISA is a basic screening test to detect HIV antibodies, and a confirmatory test, the Western blot, is always done when the ELISA is positive. The two together have a high accuracy rate. Resistance tests can help determine new drug combinations for patients who are not responding to the antiretroviral therapy. Collaborative care on the initial patient visit is to gather baseline data, begin to establish rapport, and use patient's input to develop a plan of care. Initiate teaching about the spectrum of HIV, the treatment, preventing transmission, improving health, and family planning. Perform a complete history and physical exam because these findings will help determine the patient's needs. This is also a good time to ensure that case reports required by the State Health Department have been completed. This slide looks at the medications. The nucleoside and the non-nucleoside and nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors inhibit the ability of HIV to make a DNA copy early in replication. Protease inhibitors interfere with the activity of the enzyme protease. Fusion inhibitors interfere with the HIV CD4 receptor site binding and entry into cells. The combination antiretroviral therapy, there are three or more drugs from different groups, are prescribed at full strength. Treatment regimens can be complex as these drugs have side effects and frequently interact with other medications. Antiretroviral therapy can significantly slow disease progression, but it is complex, has side effects, does not work for everyone, and is expensive. The patient should start therapy when they are ready, and that's really the most important concern, the patient readiness. Now, there are factors that can contribute to problems with adherence to treatment, a dangerous situation because of a high risk of developing drug resistance. Intervention should include teaching about the advantages and disadvantages of new treatments, dangers of poor adherence to the therapeutic regimens, how and when to take each drug, the drug interactions to avoid, and side effects that must be reported to the healthcare provider. 
an individualized approach is going to be the best way to approach this and do patient teaching with the patient. Since HIV infection can be prevented, nursing care for individuals not known to be infected with HIV should focus on preventing disease transmission. The first step is to assess the patient's individual risk behaviors, knowledge, and skills. Do not make assumptions about people or their behavior. At-risk patients are those that receive blood transfusions or clotting factors before 1985, those that shared needles, syringes, or other injection equipment with another person, had a sexually transmitted infection. These questions provide the minimum information needed to initiate an at-risk assessment. And nursing interventions can help the patient to adhere to the drug regimen promote a healthy lifestyle that includes avoiding exposure to other sexually transmitted and bloodborne diseases, protect others from HIV, maintain or develop healthy and supportive relationships, explore spiritual issues, come to terms with issues related to disease, debility, and death, and cope with symptoms caused by HIV and its treatments. Health promotion is prevention of HIV. Safe sexual activities eliminate the risk of HIV in semen and vaginal secretions. Abstinence is the most effective strategy, and there are safe options for those who cannot or do not wish to abstain. Risk-reducing sexual activities decrease the risk of contact with HIV through the use of barriers. Barriers should be used when engaging in insertive sexual activity, oral, vaginal, or anal with a partner whose HIV status is not known or is known to have HIV. The most commonly used barrier is the male condom. Female condoms are 94 to 97% effective against HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. HIV can be transmitted during exposure to blood through drug using equipment. Using equipment may be contaminated with HIV and other bloodborne organisms and sharing that equipment can result in disease transmission. The prevention of HIV is to decrease the risks. Do not use drugs, do not share equipment, do not have sexual intercourse under the influence of any impairing substance. Some communities have needle and syringe exchange programs that provide sterile equipment in exchange for used equipment. Prevention of HIV is decreasing the risk of perinatal transmission, family planning, preventing HIV in women, and appropriately medicate HIV infected pregnant women. Women need to have information about family planning, HIV, HIV antibody testing, and antiretroviral therapy if infected. Prevention at work. To decrease the risk at work is to adhere to precautions and safety measures to avoid exposures. Report all exposures for timely treatment and counseling. And post-exposure prophylaxis with combination ART can significantly decrease the risk of infection. The risk of infection from occupational exposure to HIV is small, but it is real. Should the nurse be exposed to HIV-infected fluids, post-exposure prophylaxis with combination antiretroviral therapy can significantly decrease the risk of infection. Now remember, HIV infection has no cures, continues for life, causes physical disability, impairs social, emotional, economic, and spiritual well-being, and ultimately leads to death. Caring for patients with HIV AIDS has changed dramatically in the past decade. As care has changed, so has the trajectory of HIV AIDS shifted to a disease less like cancer and more like chronic disease such as diabetes or heart disease. Prognostication of time until death is very difficult. This is especially true in young people because their basic cardiovascular health can sustain life longer than is possible in an older person with the same symptoms. The burden of a patient's death on families may be great since AIDS affects young adults and children. The needs of children who become orphaned is important. The multiple family members may also be HIV infected, anticipating their own death as well as grieving their loved ones who have just died. The stigma and social isolation surrounding AIDS can make the death of a loved one even more burdensome and isolating to the family. And this is where grief becomes complicated and complicated grief can easily become clinical depression if it is not treated. Life closure, providing hope and support, supporting the caregivers and address their concerns, achieve a sense of control, and encourage life closure. 